Step. I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, peace host and producer of OmniU Presents, the H3O Art of Life show. The title of this show is From Civil Rights to Human Rights. And certainly we want to begin by asserting a couple of things to kind of lay the ground or put the framework before you. And that is that for to assume or to assert human rights, you must first assume that you are human, which has been problematic for some people in this country to recognize some other people in this country as being human. The other thing is you have to assume that you have rights. You know, when, when, it, when we hear we take these truths to be self-evident, we have to assume that these truths that are self-evident about life and the pursuit of happiness and all of that apply to all human beings, all of whom are created equal. Now we have to just assert that because at some point in the Dred Scott decision, a black man had no rights that a white man was bound to respect. That has not been overturned as far as I know. And so now we have the, the problem of establishing those two assumptions, one of which is we are human, and the second is we have rights, and maybe the third one is we have all the rights that everyone else has. But the thing that we want to talk about, first of all, is what rights do we have? And I have two very interesting people here who are, who are able to talk about the rights that we should assume that we have and or that we ought to have. And for me, the struggle is greater than the struggle for civil rights, the right to vote and the right to wear shoes as the Haitian struggle at one point was about that, about the civil, about niceties in society. But looking at human rights is where I really want to focus and of course the civil rights come up, then human beings deserve those too. I do know that Leanne Caston is very passionate about a, a lot of things, one of which has to do with the right to have decent food to eat, which is kind of basic, you know, it's kind of duh, but there's a lot to be said about that. And I do know that Dr. Maisha Hamilton is very interested in human rights because she has a vision for establishing a museum so that we can start wherever somebody wants to start, but we put the parameters down and we know where, where we are. So let's see who wants to wade in and say something for an opening statement. I would like this. Weigh in. Let me weigh in. I like to weigh in in terms of uh, where do these rights come from. There's a word that's in the uh, Constitution and Declaration of Independence called unalienable or inalienable, inalienable rights. rights. Okay, those are human rights. And where do they come from? They come from God. Uh, they come from our Creator. They come from whatever we feel is our highest power that created us in this world. Um, so that there are human rights. And then there are civil rights. Where do they come from? They come from man. They come from government. Uh, so that it's one group of men saying to another group of men, these are what your rights are. Uh, so the most basic fundamental rights are, of course, the inalienable human rights. And what I find interesting, I've been studying the uh, Constitution for the last 10 or 15 years, and particularly the Freedom Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, the Bill of Rights. And one thing that I became acutely aware of is that 
white people in this country, I, I asked myself, what happened to white people before we had the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment? You know, what about their rights to be free from slavery? What about their rights to, for due process of law, equal protection under the laws, rights of citizens, uh, privileges and immunities of citizenship? And what I realized is that white people in the Bill of Rights, non-African descent people in the Bill of Rights, their human rights were, were protected by the Bill of Rights, human rights and their civil rights were given to them by the state. African descent people um, were not covered under the Bill of Rights because we were considered to be chattel. And so... Uh, chattel when, being property. Property being cattle or animals, property. Oh. Movable, movable property, like cows are. And so, um, so that uh, our rights, the, the rights that were given to us in the Constitution were only civil rights. We were not given human rights in the Constitution. But then it's maybe sort of a, a duh because God already gave them to us and it's one of the so, sort of a Dorothy thing, click your heels together because what you're looking for you already have, which is human rights. So I want to throw that out there. At the, uh, well, that's, that's basic. That's a basic that's assumption. Basic. Right. All right. Now. I find that to be fascinating for a couple of reasons. Because what I'm really passionate about now, um, now, <laughs> is the issue of the fact that all of us today, every single one of us, whatever we look like, we're all being fed the same garbage. Mm -hmm. And that's a fundamental human right to eat healthy food. And we're no longer able to do that. And this is not a civil rights issue. This is a human rights issue. If we want to extend it and make it a civil right, where did I hear the phrase, we are endowed with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Mm -hmm. Well, if we're endowed with life, the, the ability to live with liberty, we, are also, we also should be free to eat healthy, good food, okay? That should be part of our absolute fundamental right as human beings, and that's been taken away from us. And if you want me to, I will start in right now and talk about it. Before you start in right now and talk about it, one of the things that we were talking about before we came on, Leanne, was that you said, and, and, and to include your remarks in this as well, Maisha, you said that you've been studying this for many years. The right to know the right to have access to information, the right to have the kind of information on which you can make decisions which are in your best interest is a basic human right. If you do not know that you have rights or you don't, do not know what your rights are, if you do not think that you have rights and therefore you do not assert rights that you don't think you have, you are being denied, deprived of the human rights, which, as you point out, are inalienable. The rights you get from governments, government, the form of government does not determine inalienable rights. It on, they, the form of government only determines civil rights, what you can do on, in, a, in a particular form of government determines what you know, you're allowed to do as a citizen of a particular uh, entity. But inalienable rights transcend all of that. And so therefore they have a priority which we're not likely to give them. But to talk about being able to know, you see now uh, Leanne is gonna talk about things that she knows. How do you find out much of what you know through media? You started out, we had this started this conversation before we came into the studio. We, the, is the media serving the citizenry in such a way that we are well informed and we can therefore make good, sound decisions based on good, sound, true, reliable, valid, and some other adjectives, information? And of course, the answer is no. Not resoundingly really. 
No. Okay, so resounding. So you don't know about your food supply. Right. You don't know about your right. You don't even know what's happening to our water, which is also another basic fundamental right. Our water is going to be in serious jeopardy even though we live on Lake Michigan. And I can explain that to you as well. But first well, let's right do ahead. the food. You can but do first let's do the media, then we'll do the food, and then we'll do the water. <laughs> <laughs> can we handle that? <laughs> we can handle all of this. Good. We have an hour to handle stuff. Good. I want to say something about the um, civil rights versus human rights, which goes into the whole thing about knowing. and uh, what Civil rights are written into the law. The law serves the ruling class, period. Okay, so we know what the ruling class wants us to know. If we take our schools, for example, there was a time when schools prepared people for work. There was something called home economics. You were prepared to take care of your home. There was something called marriage and family. You were prepared to be in relationships with your children and your spouse. Uh, there was something called health. You were prepared to take care of your body. All that's gone from the curriculum. Now we're simply memorizing, our children are simply memorizing things so they can get a certain score on the standardized test. No child has, left behind test. Right, no child left behind. So it has almost nothing to do with life. We had parents who were in the home who were teaching children about uh, relationships, values, uh, character, all those things. Now both parents are working or one parent's in jail or it's just all messed up. And so we don't have parents teaching. There was a time when people were in churches and other faith institutions and now they're not teaching. So now the media is a tool of the ruling class. And so what we know, are allowed to know or have access to comes primarily from the media. It comes primarily from other people other than our parents who maybe would teach us about what we should be eating, about how we should take control of, of our government and, take, and make sure that we get what we want, government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish, but it's perished already, you know, it's, it's on one thin leg. And so uh, I think that, uh, you know, I agree with you a thousand percent that uh, food is key, because food is key to life, food, water, well, air, that's we life. We're starting with the basic right, the right to life. Right. Right. Okay, let's first start with the media because I need a quick overview on that to explain why we're not learning what we're learning, okay, what we should be. Uh, 19, 1986, Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act. That allowed for consolidation of media to the point where the corporate press today owns, and I'm not sure about the exact number, it could be either five or six, all the media in the country that most people read or subscribe to or watch. Now we're talking about starting with, starting with cable, starting with television, starting with publishing houses. One institution like General Electric or like Fox owns it all. So you've got these basic owners over here and you draw your line down, and it goes down and down. They own newspapers, they know, own magazines, they are getting the internet, they own so much that everything now becomes standardized and everything from now on, and has been for years, it's not from now on today, has been for years packaged. So if you turn the six o'clock news on, either channel five, channel two, channel seven, you're gonna get pretty much exactly the same thing. There's very little difference. Uh, who got burned, who got murdered, who got kicked out of a home, who got whatever. It's all scandal stuff and there's nothing truly important to know, nothing. So it kind of reaches the lowest level of your curiosity and if you really are at all curious, you're just gonna turn the darn thing off. It's not worth watching. Well, it's important <laughs> that we, when we say these, these outlets are own, owned, that we make sure that we underscore controlled. Thank because, you. Because, you know, you can own something. Thank you. And it's just yours because you bought it and you paid for it. Thank you. And you possess it. But control has to do with deciding for other people what it is they should know, what information they should have access Thank to, you. Exactly. and what decisions, therefore, will flow from the information that they're getting. Okay, and now, oh, we have two problems here. 
Okay. Problem number one, and when I was head of Chicago Media Watch, we saw this all the time. The basic goal of most television and cable was to bring buyers to the marketplace. That's absolutely right. There yes. was absolutely no other question. And if you time how long a talk show was going to last and then interrupted by the commercials, it pretty much is evens out. You've got pretty much the same amount of time. Okay, so it's bringing people to the marketplace and today you've got something more insidious. You have government and media working together. Right. So the media is told by government what we are to know, what we are allowed to hear. And then the media says, fine, we'll do it because we don't want to lose our contract or because whatever, or because we want access. And if we do what they tell us now, they'll give us access to another story later on. So it's a kind of trade-off, but it's insidious. It's positively insidious. And that's why, for years, we didn't know what poor Edward Snowden told us about NSA, about how everything we say in communications is being spied on, and how somewhere out in, I believe, don't quote me on this, Idaho, I believe, they're building a huge, huge building that will bring in all the communication for people to do analysis. Our Are you phones, saying this is 1984? I, last time I looked at a calendar, it was 2013. Well, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Orwell was wrong about the time, but he was right about the issues. He was. So he was talking about Big Brother. We got it, He baby. was talking about yeah. double speak. We got it, baby. When you have the re whatever is said, the re reverse is true. You got it, baby. That So you're OK. but. Think about this. Okay. Just think about this big splash about a new heir in England, a boy named George. Just think about that. That went all over the media. And instead, who knew the hideous, twisted trial that's been going on for Bradley Manning, yes. the private who had said out of integrity, out of the concern that he had about watching people kill innocent civilians in Iraq. Innocent civilians. Oh, goody, we got them. Those were the tapes. And Bradley Manning was so disgusted by that, he simply had to tell someone. And he went to WikiLeaks, and WikiLeaks put it out everywhere. Mm -hmm. And now Bradley Manning's on trial for treason. Right. And we're sitting here listening to big a, a, a prince giving birth to a, a little boy named George who's third in line of the crown. Now, we have to balance that somewhere, but we're not getting it. We are not getting that kind of balance. Well, you know, I want to go to what you uh, said about uh, the primary purpose of television and most media, print and electronic, is mm -hmm. selling. Okay, so we have programs in between commercials. Really, the main thing is to get the commercials on. And then if you can squeeze some programs in that will bring people to the TV so they can hear the commercials. Okay, that's the whole point. And so the kind of, the kind of shows that then attract people who will pay for these commercials, that's what we're going to see. Only what the people who pay for commercials want us to see. And they mostly are dummy down type things because there is a benefit in having, well, we're taught to be consumers from very young ages, so we want to increase the consumerism of people even though they have no money <laughs> because they're not working. And we want to dummy people down so that they are actually incapable of, uh, or, or will appreciate, I was listening to somebody on the bus the other day um, who was saying, oh, wow, a, a job at McDonald's. Oh, I think I'm almost, I think I'm gonna get this job at McDonald's, you know? <laughs> and so this was his aspiration was to work mm -hmm, at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. And so a dummy down population they don't see being an astronaut. They don't see being a physician. They don't see being an attorney. They don't see being all these things, an inventor. They see, you know, uh, just doing whatever because the whole purpose that we're taught is that pleasure. That's just all, it's all about pleasure, laughing, stupid stuff. Let's and laugh. Convenience. And convenience. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So there is a reason we're closing schools. There's a reason that most schools in certain areas of our city have no art or music, have no gym. They, and they are given tests interminably because they're teaching to the test. 
They're not teaching logic. They're not teaching analysis. They're, they're not, not teaching, teaching creativity. They are not teaching. Right. What they're doing is drumming out two people. People number one are soldiers because we're going to be in perpetual war. Right. And people number two are consumers because mm -hmm. they're going to be perpetually buying. Mindlessly buying because the commercial told them to. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening. We're dumbing down mm -hmm. the curriculum in public schools in certain areas. Not all, I can promise you that. There are certain areas that are doing brilliantly, but they're in the suburbs and they cost a pretty penny. Well, now you have something called the Common Core Curriculum in which teachers are supposed to be reticent. They are not really supposed to teach. What they're really supposed to do is to, uh, to mouth the directions inherent in the content and allow the students to draw their own conclusions. But little interference from the teacher, you know, actually teaching Can't is expected. Bit. Because, <laughs> you know, the, the whole idea is that there are goals that are intended. If you are trying to turn out a nation of consumers, a nation of docile automatons who you wind up with a key called a commercial, and they just trot out to the local store and fill up a basket and, and trot right up to the cashier and trot right back home. If, you, if, this, these, if this is what a nation wants its citizens to be, then certainly they have to be trained, they have to be groomed to become this. Otherwise, they might do the unthinkable. Maisha, they might aspire <laughs> to be a chemist. They might aspire to be an artist or musician or some needless thing or in society. Or they might drop out because they're bored out of their gourd. They won't stick around. And there's a huge percentage of youngsters in Chicago schools who are dropping Which out. Which is the goal. You know, you look at, I want to go back to uh, the 1600s and I'll tell you where all this comes from, just in the brief uh, uh, word. When Christopher Columbus was coming to America, they were looking for India with spices and gold and all this and that. And when they came here, they found that this country had no, very little natural wealth, very little natural resources, no gold here, very little in California, there was a little bit. We don't have a lot of natural resources here. And so then they planted cotton and then they planted tobacco and those were the crops that kept this country going. And then they had to have slave labor in order to keep the, uh, the uh, money up front the, um, what it costs to run the business low. Okay, this country is, thrives on pushing people out of the workforce. So if you're a dropout, you can't be in the workforce because we don't have jobs for everybody. There are no jobs for people. If you have a criminal history, you're not in the workforce, so then those people are gone. If you, um, uh, you know, just aren't that smart, you're out. If you're disabled, you're out. If you're mentally ill, you're out. Everybody's out. And so we don't have enough jobs or, or work opportunities, I prefer work over jobs, uh, for all the people who are here. So the purpose is to dummy people down, get people on welfare, then people don't expect much because they know that I don't deserve all this because look, I dropped out of school and I'm broke and I'm this and I'm that. And so we don't have opportunities for people in this country except to consume. And so I want to go to health now because um, I think it ties in. You know in. what I need to do? I need oh. to fade to black because I, there's something that needs to be added to the show in the okay. in the form of a person. Oh. Oh. The motive is the message. I call for you. share one mind through a vision of our future while we're holding hands to form a circle around our motherland from all around the world she is calling on her children one mind will take us there and we will celebrate our union
we're back and we're proud. We paused so that we could add to the conversation esteemed attorney Lawrence E. Kennan, who calls himself a retired attorney, but nobody believes it because he's always several places at the same time, one of which was supposed to be here. So finally, he was able to join us, and we're going to continue talking until he gets up to speed and finds out what we're talking about. But I will repeat the title, which is From Civil Rights to Human Rights. And I think Maisha was yeah. making a point, so we'll go on from there. The point I want to make is that the human body has become the primary resource in this country for people getting rich uh, and making money. Number one, we are fed this terrible food because, and it's terrible because uh, the GMO and all that comes so people can patent the food so they can make more money. You have so to use the whole thing. You can't just uh, say okay, GMO. Genetically modified <laughs> organisms. Okay. Uh, that, um, the food is processed in a way to extend the shelf life and to increase the profits of the food industry. And it makes us sick. So we get sick and then the doctors get a chance to throw, get into the game. And so now they can make money by cutting on us and giving us new diseases and illnesses. And then uh, and and giving us medicine, which costs a, a, a huge percentage of the budget goes for medicine. And so then the drug people, can now they can make their money. And then, of course, we get so fat because we're eating so much, and so the restaurants are making their money by overfeeding us these supersized drinks and these buffet dinners. So now we're fat. Now we can go to the health club, and now they can make their money. So people are making money, getting us sick and getting us well, getting us fat and getting us thin, getting us crazy and getting us <laughs> uncrazy. And so, uh, so the human being has become the resource because there was not gold here. And uh, when the slavery ended, the tobacco industry and the cotton industry were not as successful or as profitable, but the human body became the industry that people then began to use. And I use the word use specifically or deliberately uh, in order to create profitability for certain groups of people. Okay, guys. <laughs> First, I really need to talk about genetically modified food, okay? And the reason I think that's so important is because it is now promoted by our USDA, our U.S. Department of Agriculture, our EPA, and our FDA. You have to spell out all the stuff. Environmental Protection Agency and Food and Drug Administration. All three. EPA. E EPA and FDA. And that's all? Well, well so far one. on the food, yes. Okay. I could get into nuclear if you want me to, but th that's not part of what we're going to talk about right, right now. Go ahead. Okay, hold on on the nuclear. Okay. We'll get into water and I'll talk about nuclear. Okay, okay. hold on. Okay. F we've had some of the best agriculture anywhere on this planet for many, many, many years, well over a hundred. We developed agricultural technology that really could produce so much good food, so much healthy food, that we were able to send it across to all sorts of countries that needed our food. George Washington Carver helped that. Thank, uh, uh, what, who, uh, I'm not going to get into a history of who no. contributed it to it, but right. it's very important that, yeah. That food was good. It was healthy food. And years ago, my father, my own dad, was in the meat business, wholesale meat business, and we, he would talk about the inspectors who came through to see how the meat was being slaughtered, to see how the meat was being handled, he said those inspectors were wonderful. They would stamp the meat choice. They would stamp the meat prime. They would stamp the meat whatever that we needed to stamp. And that meat was clean and it was, and the meat was grass fed if it were beef. Okay, you got to note that. Today we have genetically modified seed, which means, bear with me, I'm making this up, but it's very close to truth. I've got a little seed this big. I take, I take a needle, and into that seed, which is really not very big, I put a virus, a bacteria, or a foreign substance. When I put one of these foreign substances, or a virus, or a bacteria in that seed, I'm expecting that seed to behave in certain ways. I expect that seed to repel certain pests or certain um, contaminants, whatever they are. 
and they have become on these seed producing groups so proficient they can do this to millions and millions of seeds. Now we're talking about a monopoly for two reasons. I'm a farmer. I've been sold a bill of goods that these seeds are going to help me stop using pesticides because they're going to kill off the normal pests that come to my fields. Guess what? After three or four plantings, the pests are smart. Nature is smart. These are now, the, the pests are coming back in royal force. So on one hand, you have first little weeds that we wanted to get rid of. Now, thanks to all nature, we have super weeds. So we have huge pests that are coming back that the genetically modified seed will not any more work for, and we have super weeds. Now, I want you bear with me. You've got and the super the, weeds I over have, here. I have to insert this, that the seeds do not, the, the vegetables grown from the seeds do not reproduce the seeds from no, no, those that's vegetables. No, no, that's a terminator. Do not produce. No, 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 that's a terminator. And you've got a terminator technology over here. What you have is a contract that you sign with Monsanto, and you cannot reproduce your own seeds. So once Monsanto finds out that you've tried to reproduce your own seeds, you got, you're close to losing your farm because they'll come after you with their lawyers. So what you, when you buy the GM seeds, you can't reproduce any more your own. You have to go but to Monsanto. But those seeds are terminated seeds. No, they're not. No, they're no, no, not. trust me, trust me. Okay, they the USDA will, is, something grown from that, the seed from a watermelon that's grown from a seed produced by Monsanto will produce another watermelon? It will. That's what, not what farmers tell me. Well, the farmers are now using Terminator seeds as well. Okay. But they're two different kinds of seeds. Okay. Either you sign the contract mm -hmm. or you've got a Terminator seed. And the Terminator seed will not reproduce, okay? But wait, now I'm not quite finished with this terrible scenario. Because once you sign a contract with Monsanto, once you sign that, then one, you're obligated to buy for the next X number of years the same seeds, even though the seeds might not be working. And in India, you have enormous amount of farmer suicide because the seeds aren't working. Even though the Department of their Agriculture in India has been able to promote these seeds, okay? So the farmers go in, they're not very literate, they've been farmers their whole lives, they go and buy the seeds, the seeds are not working, some of the seeds do not do well in droughts, and the farmer is now obligated to go back. He borrowed money from the bank to get this harvest in, and then he has to go to the bank and say, I have no money to pay even you back. They're killing themselves. They're killing us. Lawrence, I have to pick up that point that you were making about uh, George Washington Carver, because the food supply you know, if it can be maximized, a healthy food supply, if it can be maximized, it feeds a lot more people than mm -hmm. a food supply that is, she's, as she's saying, it's self-defeating. Eventually, it does not produce food. Eventually, we will starve. Not necessarily. As well, long as we keep buying Monsanto's food. But uh, let me finish, because this is scary. There are Please. two ways to starve, though, Leanne. One way to starve is to not have nutrition. There you go. That was what I was going to say. Well, the, there come you on. Go. Okay. The, w they have just discovered, I just got this off my, my internet today, that they're finding out the genetically modified corn, which is everywhere. It's in about 80% of our United States product. 80% of our corn is not nutritional at all. They're starving us from lack of nutrition. My point. There you go, but you're on the money. Okay. Which is why some of the African countries refuse to accept our corn. That's right, our notwithstanding our pressure. Yes. Notwithstanding the fact that the USDA is out there pushing countries to buy Monsanto's bloody seed. Mm -hmm. So number one, that's number one. Then you have number two, 
which is proven. It's called Roundup. I know about it. You know about Roundup? Mm -hmm. Roundup is made of a chemical called glyphosate, G-L-Y-P-H-O-S-A-T-E. Glyphosate is a huge poison. And on all the labels on glyphosate, it says safe, 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 which is hardly truth in advertising. It causes infertility, cancer, it causes birth defects if you're pregnant, it causes any number of serious m medical problems for your body, as you wisely say. And then I have to go to the doctor, and the doctor is going to charge me, and we've got the entire vicious circle. So we've got a program in place, and I'm going to say something radical, and you guys can respond if you want. The radical is, I don't think they give a darn. No, no, they don't. <laughs> I think if they eliminate all these slobs who can't afford organic food, it's fine. Well, you know, when you said that the body has become the raw material, right. the you know, vessel. you made a, a that was a yeah. very interesting point yeah. that when when the discoverers, which is really uh, <laughs> ridiculous, <laughs> when the when the when the settlers came, they discovered very quickly that the kind of, of raw materials that they were looking for, like uh, like uh, precious metals, uh, rubber, spices, all, all of these things were not in oh. plentiful supply here. Right. So that the body became the raw material, it became the basis of profit that you now learn to exploit it by First of all, depriving it of what it requires in order to live. So you talking, we're talking, Larry, rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we're figuring out very quickly that the right to life has to include the ability to be able to nourish life mm -hmm. with food that is not toxic and food that contains the nutrition that the body requires in order. So are we disposable people then? Yes. Let me say, yes, Go ahead. that's only one half. The other half in the modern use or misuse of the body is the prison industrial complex. Mm -hmm. So they're using us because the prisons now have been bought by private industry. Mm -hmm. And so they make their money off of us. And by us, I really mean us as products into the prison industrial complex. And so that whole industry has developed because of the use of the body as almost against slave labor, according to Mar uh, Alexander in uh, Michelle, Michelle Alexander in the New Jim Crow. New well, Jim the, Crow. the only condition under which there can be a slave is uh, based on crime. That's right. The 13th Amendment. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, all you have to do is get some laws, which Maisha was pointing out, that, you know, laws exist for the people in power mm -hmm. to exercise control over the people who have little or none. The consumer. The, all of these, all of the, we, would t we talked about media for a minute. Media exists for the people in power to control what is known and accessible by the people who need to know it in order to make the sound decisions. They are our worst enemy. In today's time, it's the media who determines who, what, where we are. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't get many people going to the lectures by people who are experts like the folks here because they get it from the media. Now that's personal media, social media, uh, hardly the newspapers because they don't read, <laughs> <laughs> but everything else, Forget and including <laughs> the pictures in the newspaper. Forget so it. I want to say something about the Thirteenth Amendment um, and about the uh, the fact that it says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist except for upon due process of law, being convicted of crime, duly processed. Okay, and then who determines what due process is? It's the state courts, and the state courts are notoriously hostile toward African descent people, and always have been. But I don't know how many people know this. There are two things I, points I want to make. One is that 
uh, there's a, uh, there was a senator named Charles Sumner in mm -hmm. the uh, uh, 1865 when the 13th uh, Amendment Liberal was, Senate. okay, he was a radical Republican. He drafted an amendment, the, the 13th Amendment that he drafted simply says that African descent people are human beings and are, are covered by all the human rights that all people have. All people, including African descent people, now have human rights. And uh, so he said it like that, but it, it got thrown out. And what was instead accepted was the, um, the Northwest Ordinance had a statement that, it, that is almost identical to the 13th Amendment. And it came in in 1787, soon after the Constitution. And uh, it said that slavery shall be uh, okay or involuntary servitude are okay if you're duly convicted. It was you know, the same language. And with the 13th Amendment, with that language from uh, Illinois was part of the Northwest Ordinance uh, Territory in that time and some other states, uh, uh, Missouri. And during that time, people were enslaved. Slave, it did not prohibit slavery. That's the, and so it was adopted by people who wanted to have a compromise, who didn't really want African descent people to have, have rights. I have to throw that out there because it, the 13th Amendment needs to go, okay? <laughs> because the only thing it did was to channel black people into slavery and it became positive law for slavery. If people know about Somerset, Somerset was a case where an African descent person who was being held in slavery in this country was taken to Great Britain in uh, the 17, early 1700s. Um, and when he got there, he was free because Great Britain says that you can't hold a person in slavery. Then the, the white man who had brought him there wanted to come back to America. And so the, some people in Great Britain wanted to make a case about uh, Somerset. And so these uh, white people who were, you know, who saw human rights as an issue became his guardian and filed a lawsuit. And the uh, courts in England says that the only way slavery can exist is if you have positive law. There has to be a law that says you can have slavery. The 13th Amendment is that positive law. It is that positive law. It's the law that was put into place to say that, yes, you can have slavery in this country, and this is the condition under which you can have slavery if a person has been duly convicted of crime. And then it says in the Article 2 to the 13th Amendment uh, that Congress shall enforce the 13th Amendment. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that Congress does not enforce. Law enforcement enforces. Mm -hmm. The executive branch of government enforces. But it gives the right to enforce. It gives the right to enforce. But, but Congress never did enforce it because they never put anything in place to define what duly convicted means. So it's whatever the judge says. I really want to hear what you have to say, Larry, okay. about that. Only one half of the 13th Amendment should be Delete it. Okay, which okay. half? <laughs> that first half that says there'll be no involuntary servitude. Now, that part that says except mm -hmm. should be deleted. That's but we part. certainly don't want to have the end of invol involuntary servitude. Right. So that is very much in our, is what caused us to be free. So, and then free, free from slavery. <sighs> yes. We're not enslaved right now, you see. Well, we that's don't, what Michelle Alexander says. No, I mean, uh, those of us who are standing up right oh, here, the four of us you and I are not <laughs> enslaved. <laughs> not I don't have a master. Mm -hmm. the, in fact, the Declaration, uh, the uh, Universal Declaration of, uh, for the United Nations. Human rights. Uh, for human rights. Declares all of this about humanity and that there can be no slavery because you can't properly enslave a human being and they set out the rights of the human being. In fact, I have a copy of the Universal Declaration mm -hmm. here, which tells all of those many, it's 20, 30 different reasons why uh, a human is human. But in the 13th Amendment, the, uh, they were always using that part of, the, the mainstream always used that part that said that except for those who were duly convicted, and duly convicted, as just happened in the Zimmerman case, mm -hmm. means that you can be duly convicted or not convicted by the, the, the whims of the racist persons who are your, your jurors. Right. And it doesn't matter what the, uh, the, the uh, evidence is. So there's a due process clause that is supposed to be followed, but due process assumes the integrity of the human beings who are responding or addressing the factual situation. But if, for instance, anything could have happened in that case, the Zimmerman case, and the, the finding would have been not guilty. The woman, and I don't want to get too far away from where we are, but the woman who was the, 20, the B-29, the sixth juror, 
cons uh, only could go so far in standing up on her belief that he was not guilty. There was a case in 1991 named Sam Ship in, a, in America, 12th juror. They, uh, it was a uh, black man who was accused of killing an officer named Sorelli or something like that with a C. He said, I don't believe that the state has proven guilty. So he says, I'm, I'm not going to vote. So they all turned, 11 of them went against him. And for three weeks, they held up that case to the jury. And he refused to stand. So the case was finally hung. Now, if, since it was a white policeman shot, they didn't want him to be found not guilty, so they kept sending the case back, and nine times out of 10, you kept sending it back, you wear down that, mm -hmm. that one juror. He refused to be worn down, so finally, the uh, judge said, all right, it's a hung jury, which should have been done after the first week. That, that was the longest holdout. The newspapers attacked him all the headlines saying this man held out and it was over every news media and everywhere else he was called all kind of horrible thing and they were threatening his life and i happened to volunteer to defend him as a person who was uh, uh, following his constitutional rights but also the instruction of the judge who says once you believe, then you should hold on to your belief and you should not be swayed just because someone else believes a different way. So that's what he did and we wrote to it and everything else and I wish I had brought that. I have the newspaper that shows what, how it's terrible. He had to go into hiding because particularly the white policemen were against him because they said that he only held out because he was black and the defendant was black. That is an example, that's the farthest example. I'm sure if this young lady had heard that that was possible, she probably would not have given in in mm -hmm. five hours that's or whatever it was. That's the truth. But if you don't know, so I, I do know that some of us lawyers, our bar association should have classes teaching our community mm -hmm. how to stand up mm -hmm. when those kinds of things, and particularly in a case where it's a black who has killed a white allegedly, that we don't have to give in because the other members of the jury. The remarkable thing about that case is though, is that Zimmerman did have a jury of his peers because he was white and he had an all white jury. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are so accustomed to being the on the defendant mm -hmm. side, we're saying that the state should have gotten his, his, the peers of the complainant. But the complainant doesn't have a right. The complainant is represented by the state, the state's attorney. So he doesn't have a right to have a jury mm -hmm. of the peers of the defendant. So it was a, a remarkable, there were so many things in that case that- What uh, you said in there sparked something it, it, about, uh, it embedded in this conversation about we have to teach. We have to teach people the things that they need to know. Yes. Because what we're doing is understanding that people are not learning the things they need to know in the places where you ought to be able to expect them to, to, to be taught them. So that when we, we, you talked about, you raised the question of the schools. If the media does not make information accessible, true, valid information accessible, if the schools curtail the kind of information that is made accessible, then whose responsibility it is it to inform people, to help people to have access to the things that they need to know about the food supply, about the water supply, about the criminal justice system, about their rights, to life and liberty and pursuit of happiness. How are people to even exercise rights that they may not have the wherewithal, they don't have the resources to, find out. to exercise the rights? Mm -hmm. Where does, how do we remedy that? Do we have parallel institutions? Do we have you, at one point I know that you were doing, there was a young lawyer's group that you were instrumental in, in um, 
mentoring. Certainly it seems to me that there ought to be some groups of people who are getting some information from people in their community who have been fortunate enough to access this information and can pass it over to them. Yeah, I'd like to go back to government of the people, by the people, for the people. I think that the people have got to take control of our institutions. And if we want certain things to be taught in our schools, we have to demand that those schools, that it be taught. This, this is our government. Uh, this is our country. This belongs to us. And we don't, should not have to pay tax money to schools that don't work and then set up another set of institutions on the side. We should make our schools work for what we want them to work for. We need to get rid of this teaching to the test. That's over. That needs to be over. That's and dead we need to in water. We need it's to start dead, teaching. Dead, dead, dead. You know, I don't know how much time you have. I would like to ask a question that uh, around Trayvon Martin. I'd like to ask a question if, and this is all ties into human rights versus civil rights. Trayvon Martin became a civil rights case and that there was some uh, idea that because he was black he was treated differently. I would like to ask the question, if Zimmerman had killed a white kid, 17-year-old white boy coming home from the store with Skittles and uh, Arizona tea drink, would Zimmerman have been found guilty? That's the human rights question because white kids, I think, would be tried based on the fact of their human rights being violated, where a black kid is tried on the fact of his civil rights being black violated. You still got two dead kids, you know, and so uh, uh, I think that race, is not, to me, race is a non-variable here. Here is a man who is armed, who pursues somebody who was running away from him. He grabs this person, he throws him, uh, he gets hit on the ground. Anybody can bleed if they hit the ground. It doesn't mean that he was the, uh, it, he could have fallen in on the ground and hit his head. So I think that the civil rights issue is what destroyed the case, that it became a civil rights case instead of a human rights case. You have a human being who's dead, who had, was armed with tea, and Skittles. I'd like to know if anybody thinks that the verdict would have been different, because I, for one, think that a, if Zimmerman had killed a white kid, Zimmerman would have been found guilty of at least manslaughter and possibly the way murder. You're absolutely right. The way the case was framed was framed as a civil rights right. issue. The way it was framed. Once, you, once that case had been framed in that way, it was impossible to introduce something called humanity, to flesh out Trayvon Martin and make him a person, a human, being. a human being who had lost his right to life, right. liberty, right. and the right. pursuit of happiness, who right. had been deprived of that right. unjustly. But it was not framed in that way, and so consequently, it was a whole different case. And that's the, the, that's the issue that we have here before us. First of all, when you say we should demand that the schools teach what we, we need a conscious community to make such demands. Right. You, you're not going to get people demanding that the schools do this or that if they don't know they don't what know the enough. schools are supposed to be doing, right. Right. what the children need, what ought to be the avenues through which they get them? So it, t you, asserting human rights, not framing always, every time there is an issue dealing with the concerns and the welfare of black people, it always becomes a part of the civil rights struggle. Now you have to march somewhere. Now you have to have some signs. <laughs> not saying that witnessing and demonstrating is not something that you do, but it is the be all. It is what you do. It is all you do. And maybe you take a case to court and maybe you don't take a case to court. Can I enter, enter into that? Go ahead. The, uh, I disagree somewhat with your statement. You got three minutes to disagree. Oh, all right. Civil rights is the, uh, due process situation. We would express for the due process that that prosecutor would have done another kind of job in there. The fact that it's civil rights doesn't mean that it's injuring us. Considering the integrity of the parties involved, there are laws that would, would have uh, permitted the, the uh, conviction of Zimmerman. But you had a racist jury in the first place. That aside, the only difference between human rights and civil rights is that your civil rights are those that are orchestrated 
and developed by the Constitution or by the legal government. Civil uh, human rights are inalienable rights. So basically, you have those regardless of where the government is or anything else. All I'm so, saying, Lawrence. Yeah, what I'm saying here, though, they didn't follow the due process here because they were saying, I followed the law, therefore I couldn't, you know. Due process says you follow the law or the facts, and the facts have to uh, uh, address that law. And here, although the facts did, they had it so confused by those people that they said, well, I had to follow this one thing. I couldn't follow anything else. That was not true. Civil rights are embedded in human rights. If the frame Correct. is too, if you have a picture that is eight by 10 and you have a four by six frame, <laughs> some of the picture is going to be outside the frame. <laughs> That's the problem. The problem is that the frame was not large enough to include all the elements that should have been in the case. As was presented by the and prosecution. Exactly. Okay. So, you know, we could go on and on talking, but we need case studies because as you pointed out, the case that you brought to our attention, you need examples yes. of people having done something, having stood their ground on principle, having taken a stand, having cast their weight on the side of justice. This is what I'm saying. We need to be advocating. You know all these things about the food supply and, and water, the water which supply, we which we didn't get to. But you, you suffice it to say, if the food supply is contaminated, the water supply is going is to be not as well. escaped attention. Yeah. Yeah. So w there's so mm -hmm. much that needs to be addressed that each one of us can find some work to do. Yeah. Well, I can, I'd like to summarize a little of this, if I may. You've got one minute to do it. Okay. We're talking about the takeover of the corporate state. The corporate state has one goal, to make money. Human life is not important in a corporate state. Mm -hmm. The share shareholders are the only ones who are going to be compensated. And so the CEO says, I'm working for my shareholders. That's it. Therefore, we've got a whole paradigm where human life doesn't count. Well, well. That doesn't end on a very happy note. It doesn't Leanne end, but we've got, to, we've got to start <laughs> dealing with that reality. Illusion. We're called by different names, and this has served to just confuse us. When all is said and done, to be one's our revolution. We never stand alone, cause you know T's our resolution. The motive is the message, our call for unity.